Over the last few years, we've seen the emergence of a new school of cruiser design. It started with the Indian Scout in 2015, then with the introduction of the Honda Rebel 1100, and just this year, Harley-Davidson introduced the Nightster 975. We see liquid cooling, trellis frames, and modular platforming on the Honda and the Harley, which is a huge departure from the tubular steel frames and large air-cooled V-twins that we're used to seeing in this market. Now, we're out here in the hills where we're gonna put these bikes through their paces, find out what it means to be a new school cruiser and see which of these bikes best embodies this new class. All right, we are now back here at our rental house. We've just spent a couple of days testing these three motorcycles in the twisties up in the hills, highway miles getting in and out of here, and then some time cruising around town. I am here with Andrew Cherney, former Cycle World editor-at-large, who uh, we brought in because of his unique specialty and experience in the cruiser market. Thanks, Morgan, man. It's great to be here. It's another beautiful day for riding motorcycles, and uh, I think these three would not be the obvious competitors you'd choose for this comparison, but they've all got their strong points. And I gotta say that there were some surprises when we rode each one of them. We, we had these kind of a foregone conclusions we came up with, and that all changed in the course of two days. Absolutely, I mean, when you look at the past cruiser comparisons that we've done, especially the last one we did together, which was the Heritage, the Heritage Classic right. versus the Indian Super, Super Chief, Chief right. these are a much different school of cruiser. You see trellis frames, liquid cooling. Right. On the Harley and the Honda, it's modular platforming. Right. So it's definitely a big shift away from the air-cooled tubular steel chassis, and now we're on to things that inarguably favor performance much more. Absolutely, I mean, you have that, and that's, I think, to me, the biggest difference in, in those two classes is that we're testing in that particular comparison where baggers, traditional, retro, very, very aligned with the past. And here we kind of see a little bit of like a foot in each camp. You know, you have a right. performance aspect and you still have trying to be an aesthetic component. And yeah. it's, sometimes it's, it's an interesting compromise. Yeah, let's talk about the performance of these engines and, yeah, let's and how that. they feel. Uh, let's start with the Rebel. Yeah. How do you feel about that, that 1100? Uh, you know, I, I gotta say, first I first got on it, I was like, okay, and this is, this is probably not fair, but the first thing that hit me was, okay, it's a Rebel. So I initially had a preconception. It's a Rebel, it must be a beginner bike. Man, you get on that parallel twin and it really does haunt. It's a powerful engine without being intimidating. Mm -hmm. And the DCT kind of meshes up with it nicely because it kind of manages to extract the power yeah. without freaking you out. I think the real fear with the automatic transmission is two things. You're gonna be less connected to the bike. Right and you're right. gonna lose low speed control. Right. I think that that throttle is so refined yeah. that you have incredible control at low speeds. It's yeah. really easy to manage. But like to your point about low speed control, that argument is out the window. That right. thing like never gave me yeah. any problems whatsoever. In town, high speeds. Yeah. And that motor, I think, it's a wolf in sheep's clothing. It just yeah. really don't realize how much you can get out of it if you really want to ride it hard. You can really go there easily. Yeah. We weren't able to dyno test the DCT model, right. but we do have our dyno test of the manual shifting model with identical equipment. That engine produced 81.02 horsepower at just over 7,000 RPM and 67.9 foot-pounds at 5,010 RPM. So that's... So more than respectable. I mean, yeah. that's, yeah, that's that's excellent. That's more more torque than any other bike in the test. Right. And, I mean, but they're all they're all pretty close. Yeah, they're all they right are, around. they are. So moving on to the Scout. Right. The Scout, it's known. That yeah. engine has not really changed since it was introduced as an 1133cc twin in 2015. When it was introduced, it really sort of walked the line between traditional cruiser engine. It is still sort of the jewel in the middle of the frame. It has that nice sort of pop, pop, pop idle. Great packaging, great, great packaging, look, great revs feel. Revs up a little higher, not as high as the other two. Right. Still produces good torque early on. It was surprisingly the fastest quarter mile time. I know, I was blown away. Yeah. Because it's a flexible engine, it's easy to ride. You can get on it and there's no snatchiness, there's no jerkiness. The fueling yeah. is great. 
and it's liquid cooled, which you don't really see that noticeably in the Indian that's, instance. That's the thing. Which I, I love, think I think you know? Indian did the best job at managing liquid cooling with the traditional cruiser aesthetic, right. where the the you get the benefits of liquid right. cooling, the high, higher rev, higher performance engine, but you also you know you don't get the same hoses, tubing right. in all these visible places that. Like the Nightster has those huge coolant yeah. tanks in the front. It's just, it's those very- huge radiator shrouds. Yeah. Indians made a, made a very, very concerted effort to kind of like streamline, hide it, and integrate it with the whole body, yeah. which I think to their credit, they've done a great job with that. I agree. Yeah. And then moving on to the Nightster engine, which the engine, in my opinion, defines the whole bike. Absolutely. It is all about the engine with that bike. Yeah. It feels incredibly sporty. It is quick revving. It revs high. Likes to sit around or above 4,000 RPM, I found. When Which I was for riding. a Harley is surprising. Yeah. I mean, if we're basing it based on like preconceptions, I mean, yeah. this engine, especially to me, like to think of this as a Harley Davidson, I was like, wow, this thing can move, you know? Yeah. And it's, it's got a responsive throttle, it's got great fueling. You don't ride it like you would normally think you would ride a Harley. Right. Likes to live in the higher rev range. Yeah. And that's where you have to ride it. Yeah. And it's happy to be there. Let's just go straight from there. Let's talk about how the how the Harley Nightster performed handling, uh, suspension, and braking. Yeah, uh, again, we're going back to uh, you know this this bike is predominantly about the engine, is a stressed member, yep. and then the chassis itself uh, is built around the engine. So the chassis, to me, it worked out really well because it was composed. There was it was stable. I mean, there was a little hint of like back end kind of flexibility in more aggressive turns. But I was really surprised by the suspension. They really nailed it because they did not have a lot of travel back yeah. there to work with. And of the three, I think the Harley has my favorite composure in terms of damping. None of the bumps really jarred me yeah. in any kind of way. And the chassis, responsive. It was light, easy to steer. Again, the levers, really easy to reach. Good feel, good engagement. Controls were absolutely where you needed them. I had absolutely no problem with any of those three components. Yeah. Um, pleasantly surprised. On yeah, all three. I think I think suspension on the Harley is is really well done. It maintained composure really well. Square edge bumps weren't hard hits. Yep. Still feel connected to the road. You can still feel what's happening beneath you. Exactly. At no point in our testing was it jarring or no. or uncomfortable. I did wish for a little bit more braking power, just a little bit more bite on the front would have benefited the ride of that bike. Handling characteristics, it tips in easy, it stays in the turn easy, just a little bit of inside bar pressure, right. and does what you tell it to. Yeah. Um, and we could mention that we probably would have liked a tiny bit more lean angle on, of course, on yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but it wasn't a deal breaker. But like I know, like I that. said in the initial review for that bike, it's three inch foot pegs. Yeah. And so I've got these yeah, you've boats got, of you, boots. You've got battleships, and, man. Yeah, and yeah. my boot is wider than that. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. it's just a trade-off. Right, know? right. You can, you can lean over, but you'll grind your boot. Right. You know? Yeah, I, I touched down once or twice, so I can only imagine how you were doing. Yeah. I was and like, on oh, the left side, I can, I can tow the peg. Right. On the right side, it's got that chunky exhaust, right. so it really yeah, no walks around it. the place. Yeah. So that, in, in my opinion, that's sort of a design oversight. Yeah. The Rebel 1100 is one of the easiest bikes to ride. I've ever spent time on. It is just an easy motorcycle to get on yeah. whatever your skill level and just yeah. rock it away. It has the most available lean angle, it feels balanced, it feels light, it's capable. You just take good off good fueling, and do exactly what you good want. chassis, yeah. just ABS, responsive. ABS and traction right. control right. Uh, both feel well tuned. Traction yep. control is three level adjustable, right. as is power delivery, engine braking, right. shift points on the DCT. Right. It by really the hit it. by the numbers, it hit everything: horsepower, torque, yep. braking, lean angle. It's, it's kind of like it shows you, like, oh my God, this thing is winning on all these counts. There are some intangibles that you don't think about, especially with a cruiser, yep. that just don't translate into that kind of stuff. And yeah. I think the Rebel suffered for it. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, I think so. Moving on to the handling on the Rogue. The Rogue flows really well, handles nicely. The mm -hmm. suspension is lacking. 100%. That is his biggest single hands down flaw. Yep. 
biggest single flaw. And the, the front is a little soft, but the back is soft. There's not a lot of travel. Any square edge bump and you're it's right throwing away, it to your spine. Right the angle of back. the shock and everything too. Right. Kind of adopts that Indian slammed approach which the bobber sure, has, sure. so it's lowered. I mean, yeah. and, it's and it's for styling It's reasons. a decision, for yeah, sure, to fit absolutely. the cruiser aesthetic, that, that low ride absolutely. look, you know, but the ride suffers because of it. Right, and, and to your point, um, once you get into a flow, once you're at speed, the handling is surprising well because when I first got on it, I was like, this thing steers heavy. Sure. Way heavier than the other sure. two, right? No question. But once you get going, it responds. But that's it. It's it's about flow. If you do too, right. too quick or abrupt of inputs, it you will, can upset the chassis yes. and you'll get a wiggle. It will let you know. For sure. For sure. Yeah. yeah. And absolutely. when we talk about handling, we can't skip over the rogue's lean angle. No, we it, can't. It we, is, <laughs> it is, well, we're going to get to that because we wanted to mention that last. It's very easy to scrape peg on that right. bike. I Yeah, I'll scrape peg coming out the driveway. Pretty but much. You're pretty quick to hard points past yes. that. So, so you have to be careful. You about, have to stop once yeah. once you hit that your peg. You don't. Right. You can't keep tipping can't push over. it. And, and that is a function of you know the limited travel out back, the slam stance, yes, yes. all that stuff kind of translate. It's got the lowest, I think, believe the lowest seat height of the bunch, and that all kind of flows into that same reasoning. Yeah. So, you know, you're gonna suffer on those all those aspects because yeah. of that. Styling and presence. Okay. So we all know styling, presence being more of the engine sound, the feel to the bars, right. how you feel when you're on the bike, the, the intangibles, response. yeah, exactly. exactly, yeah. The Harley Davidson Nightster and the Honda Rebel 1100, to me, they feel much more like a standard motorcycle in the cruiser silhouette. Right. The engine is modern, muffled, you know, fast at idle. They don't necessarily scratch the traditional cruiser itch of. The, the Scout nails, I think. Absolutely, like there's there's absolutely no question, even from from whether you're talking about visual perspective, sonic perspective, or that kind of intangible yeah. emotional perspective. I mean, the Scout maintains that traditional silhouette that we're all used to, that dip in the middle, that kind of bob fender, the mini apes, you know, the big wheel in front. People who ride cruisers, I think, just gravitate towards, and, and I get where, Honda and Harley are going. They're going for performance. Sure. They're going for and you know, it's worth mentioning that those power. two those two brands are uh, it's a modular platform. Those right. engines exactly. are going to be used in other ways. Exactly. So the the styling, but they at didn't, least they in didn't, this case, yeah. I think suffers from that. They didn't surround that engine with probably could have been a little more retro styling, kind of nod to some heritage, kind of refer to the lineage of the Sportster, especially, which has been right. around for, you know, right. more than half a century. And I mean, you see the, draw the traditional um, shape of that cover. Tank. Yeah, Sorry, exactly. not a tank. The, the right. airbox cover. And you know what they're referencing. Right. But when you're there on the bike, you have this domed up plastic cover on the top that you can see through the sides. You mm -hmm. can see wires through the front and through the sides. It just seems like there was a, a lot of sacrifice made to get these high levels of performance with the downdraft intake and, and the right, gas tank exactly. under the seat. Um, and and, that's, and then to their, to their credit, there are challenges in that packaging, right? Like how do you hide all the wiring and the right. hoses and the radiator right. and the plumbing? You know, and you have to make room for that gas tank under the seat now because yeah. it's no longer up here. So I think the Nightster excels at a performance-based uh, product, yes. but it does have to compromise necessarily yeah. to that retro tradition and aesthetic style, which yeah. I think people are gonna notice. With the Rogue's initial release, how it was sort of liquid cooling, but still in this traditional cruiser space, and yep. it was really walking that line, yep. it's, not a traditional steel chassis, yep. and then you have the dual spar frame under the tank. Yep. It is a non-traditional frame, yes, that, but with the steel gas tank, you still have traditional lines. Yes, it uses like a foundational, like a modern foundation when yeah. you really think about yeah. it. It's not just like a, you know, a loop, you know, cradle frame. Yeah. And then it puts on these really recognizable styling cues that people look across the parking lot, they're like, oh man, that's a presence. That's a solid, yeah. you know, 100% beefy motorcycle. Especially this Rogue with the 16 and 19 inch wheels. Right. It gives it that stance. It yep. just, it makes it look like a more traditional cruiser when yeah. you still get the benefits of liquid cooling. Yes. Uh, and so now 
ergonomic. Ah, last. It was really surprising that the same trouble that I found with the Honda Rebel 1100, that the foot pegs were wedged real tight so that you could get that lean angle, it had me sort of cannonballed. I was right here. My hands were about eight inches from my knees and yeah. my knees are six inches past the knee dents on the gas tank. Oh, it did not look pretty, dude. Riding behind you, I was like, oh my God, yeah. that's... <laughs> and, and it didn't feel nice. No, Honestly, I can't I, imagine. I rode, uh, what, 80 miles up here on the highway mm -hmm. and my hip flexors were killing me and yep. there's no option, you know? I'm... Even for me at five foot six on a good day, my hip flexors were kind of barking a little bit after 45 minutes. I mean, I love riding the bike and that's yeah. why I just was like, I don't care, it's fun. But when I got off the bike, I was like, oh man, that is gonna be really hard to do for more than an hour. You know? Did your knees fit into the t dents on the tank a little bit better? Um, a little bit better, but you know, I think that was, that was a styling concession. I was like, yeah. there's no reason for this. <laughs> yeah. The uh, ergonomics on the Nightster, I found were pretty good. It's not as sporty as I would like to take full advantage of that engine, but it does fit the design well. Yeah. With the low bars and the mids. It's a little more upright, a little yep. more 90 degree here at the, you know, yep. peg to leg bend. Yep. So it works well for me, you know, I don't have long arms like you do, but wasn't too much of a reach. Actually for me, my legs, the, 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 the mid mount pegs fit perfect. Great. So that was, the bike for me that fit me oh, the nice. best. Good. So I was really happy with that. Yeah. Um, for me, it was the Rogue. Yeah. Um, Understandably, you know, yeah. It's, it's forwards. Yeah, those mini apes, you yep. know, put me right right up here. Yep. Really good stance. Those forward controls, because of the small chassis, they're almost like three quarter mids. Right. So, right. so you can actually stretch out yeah, a little bit. And yeah, and I, I was very comfortable. Fit and finish is an area that Harley Davidson has always set a very high bar. Right. And we've always sort of address them as the example of, of... They set the bar, others have to aspire right. to it, and this is where they didn't meet their own bar, right? They yeah. absolutely did not. I mean, yeah. we look at this Nightster and you can see a lot of shortcomings as far as fit and finish. Yep, right. You can see wiring through the front. There's some, looks like slag, like, like right. miscasting on the where the uh, cylinders meet the engine. It's a highly engine visible case. piece of the motorcycle. It needs to be an accent piece. It needs to be detailed nicely. It needs to just have better yeah. presence. And then you look on the left side of the bike. Mm. It is. Oh, that's a whole nother story. It's a nest. Yeah. Yeah. It's a crazy bird's nest yeah. of tubing and wires. And, yep. and it just, it does not reflect the time and energy that we're used to seeing Harley Davidson put right. into that cleanliness. It's especially kind of a disconnect when you think about how much work, time, and development they put into that engine, which works marvelously. And then you have these external pieces like, you'll think like, oh, this bike is not gonna be well performing because they haven't paid any attention to the details. So they're shooting themselves in their own foot yeah. because of that. Um, yeah. So that needs to be addressed for sure. Again, it's just a huge part of who they are. Cruiser motorcycles, yeah, yeah. because it's a huge part of Harley yeah. Davidson who's defined cruiser right. motorcycles right. for so long. And they've done this so well for so right. long that we really can't look the other way. Yeah, on fit and finish on the Rebel, I thought was pretty, It was, pretty, it was good. pretty good. I mean, it was probably above what it, you would expect it to be. Yeah. And that's based on, you know, everyone's got a different perception of what the Honda's gonna be, but you know, typically they have pretty good quality, pretty yeah. good, you know, a couple of cheap pieces, but it worked really well. It was clean, it was tidy. Everything was put just together well. Out, sort of disappears. Right. The engine, parallel twin, probably not the easiest thing to package, but they kind of made it work. Mm. It kind of like tucked in there. Yeah. But fine. again, rather than the Harley and the Scout, which are big, bright, and right in the middle yeah. when you look at it, right. the Rebel just blacked it out yeah. so you sort of just it's narrower. Don't, yeah. don't pay attention. Right, exactly. You don't notice it, it's not a focal point. Yeah. Aside from the cruiser ethos of right. style and presence aside. and feel, yeah. the Rebel is undoubtedly easiest to ride and just best performing motorcycle on this course. Objectively, yes, right. just and, based on performance. And it's the cheapest, which is yep. just an added benefit. Right, exactly. As we said earlier, like how are we gonna weight these different characteristics? And in the cruiser world, aesthetics, styling, and look are huge. They're yeah. overweighted aspects and right. we have to recognize But they're that. also very personal aspects. You True, know, what Subjective. you think is cool, yeah. I might not think is cool. Yeah. It, it's all sort of personal things. Yeah, and totally. a lot of the buying decision in this market is emotional. You know, so 100%. it's that stuff that we can tell you this bike is lighter, faster, leans further. 
That might not mean anything might to you, not mean or it anything, might mean everything. You have, oh, right. may have already made up your mind that right. this is where I'm going based on presence, yeah, you, saw, you saw it in a magazine, that's the bike I want, right. you know? So when you look at what defines these three motorcycles, you have the Honda Rebel 1100, which is an excellent performer, but it's sacrificed ergonomics to get that high lean angle. It sort of bumped those foot pegs up, which puts us all in a pretty cramped position. You look at the Harley Davidson, and it's sacrificed aesthetics for a high performance engine and that low center of gravity. It doesn't really satisfy what we're used to expecting from Harley Davidson. And then you look at the Indian Scout Rogue, which sacrifices handling and suspension comfort for that more traditional cruiser design and, and aesthetic. Yeah, they went all in on the aesthetic. They went all in on the traditional cues and they did a great job with it. And I think that the guy that's buying that bike, he probably won't be bothered by a suspension or maybe actually the handling, the foot pegs touching down. Sure. But it's something that's worth noting and it's definitely its biggest flaw. The Honda, again, wonderful motorcycle in every aspect, performs great. Again, hampered by the uh, you know foot peg height. Yeah. And the Harley, fit and finish, they sort of uh, drop the ball on it. Yeah. Uh, great performing motorcycle and fun to ride, but what we're used to from them is something a little more kind of cohesive. So I think without a doubt, the Honda Rebel 1100 is the highest performing motorcycle on this comparison. It was the easiest to ride. It felt the most confidence inspiring. So that's it for this comparison. The 2022 Honda Rebel 1100 DCT is our winner as the best new school cruiser. For the full story, head over to cycleworld.com. And if you like what we're doing, like, follow, subscribe, and we'll see you on the next video.